Peter B. Collins News and Comment. It's Wednesday, May 20th, 2020. Just a little programming note, your humble host will be taking a long holiday weekend. I'll be off on Friday, Monday, and hope to be back with you on Tuesday. I happen to carry an Apple iPhone, and I know many people who do. I also am aware of the Android problem, <laughs> and there are fans of both platforms. But today we reveal to you two different vulnerabilities of the iPhone that many of my listeners also carry. Number one, a whistleblower who worked as a contractor for Apple in Ireland and was part of the team that listened to recordings of exchanges between iPhone users and Siri, the digital voice. And what he blew the whistle on is stunning. He says that big tech companies like Apple are basically wiretapping entire populations. And he was part of the team, as I say, that listened in to recordings. And Apple says, well, you know, these recordings are supplied by people who opt in, who say they're willing to have their exchanges with Siri evaluated so we can sharpen Siri's listening skills, Right. Well, it reminds me of my friend Roy Zimmerman's song about the NSA. They listen. They really listen. So 25-year-old uh, Thomas Labaniak worked for Apple at the facility in Cork, transcribing user requests in English and French, and he quit last summer due to ethical concerns with the work. He said they operate on a moral and legal gray area. And they've been doing this for years on a massive scale. They should be called out in every possible way. And so he said that the... I, I listen to hundreds of recordings every day from various Apple devices, phones, watches, iPads. These recordings were often taken outside of any activation of Siri. And if you know how it works, you use the woke word, hey Siri. And then she dings at you, and you can ask her a question, and she often tries to answer it. The same is true, by the way, of uh, Alexa, the Amazon uh, robotic device. So he continued, These recordings were often taken out of the activation in the context of an actual intention from the user to activate it for a request. These processings were made without users being aware of it and were gathered into data sets to correct the transcription of the recording made by the device. The recordings were not limited to the users of Apple devices, but also involved relatives, children, friends, colleagues, and whoever could be recorded by the device. The system recorded everything, names, addresses, messages, searches, arguments, background noises, films, conversations. I heard people talking about their cancer, referring to dead relatives, religion, sexuality, pornography, politics, school, relationships, or drugs with no intention to activate Siri whatsoever. These practices are clearly at odds with the company's privacy-driven policies and should be urgently investigated by data protection authorities and privacy watchdogs. So this confirms what we've long suspected. And I do use the dictation function that Siri facilitates. And it's frustrating because she gets so many things wrong and you got to correct it and it's kind of difficult to go back and get the cursor right in there between words or numbers, whatever you're trying to fix. And we've known that the government has capabilities to activate the camera in your phone, the camera on your computer, without your knowledge. And it's unusual that NBC News would be the source of the exposure of the way that a private company that supplies its technology to law enforcement, including the FBI, has developed a way to hack into phones that use numbers as the password. And it appears that uh, they haven't developed the capability to 
uh, dummy up a facial image for the latest. It's the uh, 10 series and later, I believe. And I don't know about fingerprints, but I still use, uh, you know, a series of digits as the password to my devices. So software made by Grayshift, an Atlanta-based company called Hide UI, it uh, can track a suspect's passcode when it's entered into a phone. This comes from law enforcement leakers. The spyware has been available for about a year. This is the first time details of its existence have been reported, in part because of non-disclosure agreements that police departments sign when they buy the device or the software called Gray Key. And essentially what it does is it inserts spyware into the phone, bypassing the password. And then when the user accesses his or her phone, the spyware records the passcode. And one of the, uh, oh, this is uh, an attorney from the ACLU, Jennifer Granick. This is messed up. Public oversight of policing is a fundamental value of democracy. And when these kinds of novel tools uh, with them, we see a real desire for secrecy on the part of the government. And like the rollout of Stingray, you've heard me rant about that for years now. That is the device that simulates a cell phone tower, causes local phones to check in with it, and depending on the level of sophistication of the box, it can uh, force your phone to dump all kinds of data. And we believe some versions can actually intercept live conversations and grab keystrokes as you type in to your phone. And as you know, there's been this public battle between Apple, which stands firmly behind its encryption. Of course, that's the company's posture. And we hear the FBI and, you know, the stalwart sheriff like Bill Barr, James Comey before him, demand that we must have a back door into these phones. Well, <laughs> I think they protest too much because... While this is not set up as a hacking system, we're told that within uh, minutes it can crack a four-digit personal identification number and in less than a day, a six-digit PIN. And, of course, if the user is tricked into accessing their phone, like while they're being interrogated, hey, call your lawyer, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, you're doing all of that legwork for them. And, of course, this operates in a gray area. They should be requiring uh, warrants before this kind of activity occurs. But we know that there are a lot of end runs that are made on your Fourth Amendment rights on a regular basis. So now I'm going to take a few minutes to air out what is a very interesting online and media buzz that started on Sunday. And I get the print edition of the New York Times on Sunday, but I didn't dig deeply enough into it to read Ben Smith's latest piece. Before I dive into the contents of it, I want to just tell you the arc of how this, how this uh, was reported to me. First, it was an email from... Our friend, whistleblower, listener, subscriber, Joe Carson, who lives near Knoxville, Tennessee. And early Monday morning, as I reviewed my overnight emails, I was copied on one from Joe Carson to Ben Smith at the New York Times. And Carson commented on the takedown of Ronan Farrow. That's the topic we're going to get into in a moment. So then on Monday in my daily survey of the news... I printed out Ben Smith's piece, and then I noticed that Glenn Greenwald had already hammered out a rejoinder of sorts, and uh, the original Ben Smith piece I printed out was 10, 11 pages. The Greenwald response in a larger font was 25 pages, and so I put them aside to read later, and I just got around to them last night. And actually, I'm glad I waited because uh, then there was a response to the Smith piece by Eric Wimple, who is a, a decent media writer at the Washington Post. And then we got a denial claim 
uh, published today from Matt Lauer. So that, that's a quick overview of this sequence. And first, I want to commend Joe Carson. He is a longtime whistleblower at the Department of Energy and has held on to his job despite uh, breathing into that whistle and breathing hard. And he praised Ben Smith, kind of. He said, I read your takedown of Ronan Farrow, and from what you write, if it is in fact consistent with the journalistic standards you claim to uphold, you score some valid points. But my reaction is, so what? The New York Times reporters, editors are, in my experience, just like Ronan Farrow, putting career interests before duty to the common good when journalism ethics might be, shall I say, inconvenient to their career interest. And Joe goes in to talk about his own experience as a whistleblower and the blackout of his claims and his punishments by the New York Times and other major media. And it's a valid set of complaints from Joe Carson. So then we turn to Ben Smith's piece. Now, Ben Smith joined the New York Times earlier this year after about nine years as the editor of BuzzFeed. And while he has a journalism career that preceded BuzzFeed, it's fair to say that he presided over a tabloid style <laughs> uh, website that does some excellent reporting. And it does some shitty reporting, too. But the actual reporting is buried in all this pop culture bullshit, all these listicles and uh, celebrity gossip stories. And I visit BuzzFeed to try to tease out the good reporting that occasionally gets published there, you know, a couple of times a week. And today, later in the stack here, I do have a good report from BuzzFeed. But we have to put Ben Smith's work in that context. And so he decided, based on uh, a, a, a mistake, a report that Ronan Farrow wrote that Jason Leopold, my old pal who continues to work at BuzzFeed, uh, teased out. And it related to a story that was published in uh, 2018 about tax records of Michael Cohen, Trump's former lawyer who is now in prison and Trump never met him, didn't know him, <laughs> and all that. So, uh, number one, it appears that Ronan Farrow was wrong about that reporting, and Ben Smith properly criticizes that error and Ronan Farrow's refusal to stand up and admit it. And then he goes into a kind of big picture view. He says that there is a kind of new style of journalism and that young writers like Ronan Farrow doesn't always follow the typical journalistic imperatives of corroboration and rigorous disclosure. And he suggests conspiracies that are tantalizing, but he cannot prove. Now, I'm going to return to that meme if you'll indulge me, in a moment. But I don't want to interrupt uh, the way he threaded the uh, what appears to be inaccurate reporting in the Michael Cohen tax records case, and it appears he was misled by his source. And so Smith intones, Mr. Farrow, now 32, is not a fabulist. His reporting can be misleading, but he doesn't make things up. His work reveals the weakness of a kind of resistance journalism that has thrived in the age of Donald Trump, that if reporters swim ably along with the tides of social media and produce damaging reporting about public figures most disliked by the loudest voices, the old rules of fairness and open-mindedness can seem more like impediments than essential journalistic imperatives. So then he shifts to the sensational reporting that Farrow has done about sexual harassment and sexual crimes by people in high places. And he praises him for outing Eric Schneiderman. And then he goes into detailed takedowns of his reporting on Harvey Weinstein. Now, it, at this point, I need to let you know that I have never read Ronan Farrow's book. And a lot of this criticism is about the book. And it's about how in promoting the book, Ronan Farrow 
subtly made claims about the number of corroborating witnesses who he had at various stages. And the two main stages are when he was at NBC and he claims they refused to allow him to go on the air with a report that he said he had two women willing to go on camera. And then when he was refused airtime, we call that having a story spiked, he went to the New Yorker. And they have standards and a history of rigorous fact-checking there. And then he published his story that led to, ultimately, the conviction and jailing of Harvey Weinstein. And so I, I don't want to go through every detail of the uh, criticism, but he makes the point that in the case of Matt Lauer, that Ronan Farrow didn't have sufficient evidence to accuse him of rape. Matt Lauer resigned in disgrace. He has generally kept silent. And I do not know the particulars of what went on. What was reported is that Matt Lauer had a, a, a special lock on his office door that only he could open with a buzzer under his desk and that women would get lured in there and he'd essentially lock them in and have his way with them in some manner. I don't want to suggest that it was always uh, you know, a formal sex act. And so since I haven't read the book Catch and Kill... Uh, I don't feel qualified or competent to get into all of those details. The other issues are, was uh, Harvey Weinstein blackmailing NBC by threatening to expose Matt Lauer? And did the mouthpiece Nick Merrill for Hillary Clinton basically threaten Ronan Farrow over his exposures of Harvey Weinstein? Or was Nick Merrill trying to find out if Ronan Farrow was going to go public with the story because Hillary Clinton had agreed to do some kind of documentary with Weinstein? And once again, I can't evaluate those claims. But that's a, a quick summary of what Ben Smith takes apart in the reporting of Ronan Farrow. Now, I, I want to quote from you again the opening kind of presses, presses of Ben Smith. Because it is fair for him to demand corroboration, rigorous disclosure, proof of conspiracies. And Glenn Greenwald, who I'll cite in a moment, repeatedly quotes this passage that I've quoted once, and I'm going to underscore it, but I want to put it in another context. Ben Smith has written a couple of critical pieces about other media outlets. But so far, he has not chosen to examine the yellow journalism and the media malpractice of his current employer, the New York Times. And when you apply, in a different frame, the critique offered by Ben Smith, and we shift the frame to the Russiagate reporting that was based on leaks that advanced a conspiracy that could not be proven and ultimately has been, at least in part, undermined, if not disproven. And the New York Times has not faced the music. And it doesn't appear that Ben Smith or even Glenn Greenwald is ready to force that point. So, once again a kind of resistance journalism that has thrived in the age of Donald Trump, that if reporters swim ably along with the tides of social media and produce damaging reporting about public figures most disliked by the loudest voices, the old rules of fairness and open-mindedness can seem more like impediments than essential journalistic imperatives. And I submit to you, my listeners, that the New York Times is more guilty of that charge in the era of Trump, in the reporting on Trump, than Ronan Farrow is in his reporting on Harvey Weinstein. Later here, Smith cites, uh, who is it, Ann Diebel, 
who is a critic and private detective. And she described the work of Mr. Farrow as new journalism on the sly, using novelistic technique to make his case. Once again, I think that applies to the reporting of the New York Times. And so I find this fascinating. And as you can tell, I, I am not taking a particular position on Ronan Farrow. Ben Smith's critique is pretty persuasive. And as Joe Carson says, so what? <laughs> so then we turn to the piece that uh, Glenn Greenwald cranked out in record time Sunday evening in Brazil. And... In his piece, he also deflects or defers. He said, I'll leave the assessments of Smith's specific critique of Pharaoh's reporting to others more steeped in the specifics. What is particularly val valuable about Smith's article is its perfect description of a media sickness born of the Trump era that is rapidly corroding journalistic integrity and justifiably destroying trust in news outlets. And he quotes what I have quoted twice here about resistance journalism. And Greenwald continues, In assailing Farrow for peddling unproven conspiracy theories, Smith argues that such journalistic practices are particularly dangerous in an era where conspiracy theories are increasingly commonplace. Yet unlike most journalists with a mainstream platform, Smith emphasizes that conspiracy theories are commonly used not only by Trump and his movement, but are also commonly deployed by Trump's enemies. Now, I'm with Greenwald on what he's saying here. But he fails to mention the New York Times or the Washington Post, the biggest offenders. He does, of course, hammer MSNBC, properly slams Rachel Maddow for her, what I call, the telenovela. And then he goes sideways to continue his ongoing feud with Marcy Wheeler, the online blogger. And as I've told you, I don't read her work very much. I don't think she is a big potato. She's entirely, uh, you know, uh, uh, welcome to have her viewpoint and express it. But she takes uh, Russia Gate hook, line, and sinker. She repeatedly calls it Russia attacking our country. And I understand that Greenwald and Wheeler have their own little battle going on, and they're welcome to it. But my point here is that Greenwald marshals very important arguments and targets them at the wrong places. <laughs> All right. So then to Eric Wemple, who is the most critical voice at the Washington Post. And I've linked to his piece so you can read it. But he goes through the Ben Smith critique and uh, kind of evaluates some of those points. And he adds some of his own commentary. And there has been a partial walk back by Ronan Farrow. In a tweet, Farrow said, Ben Smith notes a Weinstein script from NBC and a radio interview I gave about it. The book discusses that draft and its account is accurate. In the interview, I misspoke. What I should have said was that there were at least two women named or willing to be named as the book lays out. And then Wemple uh, bullet points various interviews that... Farrow did in promoting the book, and he says uh, at one point, uh, there was no draft that I gave to NBC that had fewer than two named women. No draft fewer than two named women. Multiple women named in every draft. In every draft, we had multiple women named. Uh, so you get the point. And, uh, you know, I think it is fair to carefully examine the work of Ronan Farrow. <laughs> but it is about... I'm sorry, I, I just uh, censored my own expletive there. It is about effing time that these outlets come to Jesus about the way they have misguided the American public. They invested so much in Bob Mueller's investigation which I have derided as a limited hangout, didn't even interview key people involved, 
and it flat out lied by saying that Russia, you know, interfered in the 2016 election in a quote system, system uh, systemic way. That was it, not systematic, systemic. And it cited the false assessments of the CIA intelligence reports that were based on crowd strikes, unconfirmed assessment that Russia had hacked the DNC. And that is a much more significant issue than anything I've ever seen Ronan Farrow report on. So just to complete the arc here today, Matt Lauer accused Farrow of shoddy and biased journalism in the book Catch and Kill, which included the rape accusation against the former Today Show host. Lauer said, like Ben Smith, that Farrow had not corroborated several specific accusations against him in the book. NBC fired Lauer in 2017 for an inappropriate relationship with a co-worker. And Lauer said that that person, Brooke Nevels, said that Lauer, oh, I'm sorry, Farrow reported that Brooke Nevels said that Lauer raped her in a hotel room in Sochi, Russia, during the 2014 Winter Olympics. And Lauer denies that charge, saying that it was a subsequent, I'm, I'm sorry, that they had a subsequent consensual relationship. Now, we have to look at that carefully. Because you can be raped by somebody on one occasion and consent to it on another before or after the incident described as rape. So uh, there we have that little interesting uh, sequence of reporting and counter-reporting at various outlets over the last few days. In a somewhat related matter, Aaron Blake at the Washington Post, writes today about whether people like me were lied to and that I believe the lie that Donald Trump said that he has been taking hydroxychloroquine. And I actually didn't allow for that in my commentary on it yesterday. But we've been lied to so much by this guy that I guess it seems repetitive and... <laughs> unnecessary to suggest that he could be lying about that or any other thing that comes flying out of his mouth on any given day or that comes flying out of his Twitter account. So Blake talks about the argument that we shouldn't have paid attention to the claim that Trump is taking the drug because it's obviously covering up for the problematic firing of the inspector general of the State Department. And I have to say that I have fallen into the same pattern where I believe that I can deduce that Trump is saying A to distract us from B. And sometimes I feel pretty strongly in my deductions, and other times I have criticized people for making the same kind of connection. But here's a, a tweet from the senator from Hawaii, uh, Brian Schatz. I don't think it's hilarious or trivial or a distraction. Look, he's either taking a drug that he shouldn't or he's lying about it. In the middle of the worst pandemic in the 100 years with 90,000 dead, everyone is too savvy nowadays. This is completely insane. And then Blake goes on to list... The recent claims of Trump about Obamacate, Obamagate related to the Russia investigation. He calls them baseless accusations. Well, he is locking down on the Russiagate narrative that the Washington Post was central to promoting based on anonymous leaks and what I think was a carefully scripted psychological operation that came from taxpayer-funded intelligence and law enforcement agencies. So it, it, is, uh, it causes my bald head to spin. <laughs> As I see some valid criticism and some of this circling of the wagons to defend Russiagate. All right, let's move on here. 
Mike Pompe uh, Pompeo was just referenced, right? Uh, his request to Trump to dismiss the Inspector General of State, Steve Linick. Was that what Trump was distracting us from? Well, I don't really know. But Pompeo is moving into denial overdrive, saying that, uh, frankly, Linick should have been dismissed a long time ago. And then he makes a claim that is uh, very hard to believe. Let's be clear. There are claims that this was for retaliation for some investigation that the inspector general's office here was engaged in. That's patently false. I have no sense of what investigations were taking place inside the IG's office. Couldn't possibly have retaliated. <laughs> well, on the PBS NewsHour, on Monday evening, they trotted out the former uh, leader of the inspectors general of the government. And he wasn't laughing, but he gave it the equivalent of a laugh-off, saying that Pompeo's claim is, uh, and I'm not quoting, I'm paraphrasing, but preposterous. Joe Biden held an online fundraiser that was organized by the former U.S. ambassador to Israel, Dan Shapiro. Some 550 people zoomed in to pledge cash for Joe. Oh, and he pandered, just as they expected. Listen to this uh, double talk. Criticism of Israel's policy is not anti-Semitism. But too often, that criticism from the left morphs into anti-Semitism. And this is a signal that Joe is in the pocket of Israel and its American supporters. He said, we have to condemn it, and I've gotten in trouble for doing so. Well, he and many others support the measures at the federal level and in 28 states to essentially tell us that we do not have free speech when it comes to boycott, divestment, and sanction targeted toward Israel. And Biden reassured his supporters there that if elected, he would not attempt to move the U.S. Embassy from Jerusalem back to Tel Aviv. And, of course, he pledged allegiance. My commitment to Israel is absolutely unshakable. Great reporting on that from Alan McLeod at Mint Press. Well, the Ukraine Gate story is coming back. And I have predicted this. I don't make a lot of predictions, and I don't generally, you know, pat myself on the back for these things. But it's been obvious. Rudy Giuliani has never sprung whatever it is that he researched on his last trip to Ukraine. And over at the Homeland Security Committee in the United States Senate, Ron Johnson rammed through a subpoena today to force the turnover of documents related to Hunter Biden's work for the Ukrainian energy company Burisma. And as I pointed out in the past and around the impeachment proceedings last year and into January, what Hunter Biden did was nepotism. He was only placed on the board of Burisma because who his daddy is. And whether Papa Joe arranged it, facilitated it, or just looked the other way behind a stinky effort to influence him by paying his son grossly over, uh, grossly overpaying his son, that's what I really want to say, for minimal no-show work for the uh, controversial and possibly corrupt energy operation there. Uh, this is going to be back. This is all timed so that it can be uh, played out during the fall campaign. And, as I have said, the claims by the Biden family and by their Democratic supporters that nothing, nothing, nothing was done wrong. Well, I'm sorry. We hold people to the standard of the appearance of a conflict of interest. And at minimum, Hunter Biden's job at Burisma was well beyond that trigger line. Interesting op-ed in today's New York Times under the byline of Volodymyr Zelensky. You know him, the comic-turned-president of Ukraine. 
and he kind of looks back wistfully over the past year. He says, remember President Trump's impeachment? A lot of people don't. And he refers to his own life in showbiz. He said, after chasing higher ratings for most of my life in the entertainment business, it took only one phone call to become truly world famous. The impeachment story was not comfortable for me. It took American and international attention away from the issues that mattered most to Ukraine and turned our country into a story about President Trump. He says his bigger challenge is the Ukraine war with the Russian-backed illegally armed groups in the Donbass. And that, of course, was why he was kissing up to Trump in the perfect phone call. Which he says, no matter how many opinions, rumors, and theories swirled around that phone call, and despite the fact that the controversy resulted in Trump's impeachment, Ukraine remains a good partner and friend of the United States. We received that military assistance. <laughs> so he, he's still desperately trying to curry favor with Trump while kind of signaling uh, a subtext. I've linked to it if you'd like to read it. It's in the show file here at peterbcollins.com. Well, every day I mention my PBC Podcast Community Fund. We're offering $100 grants to listeners and people they know who have hit hard times and run out of money and for whom 100 bucks could uh, really make a difference. And so if you're in that position or you know somebody who is, write it up. Send me an email, peter at peterbcollins.com. We haven't turned down a request yet. And that is the entire purpose of the fund. And I want to thank Craig Daniels, who, along with his wife Peggy, mailed in a check which is going into the community fund. He also added uh, thanks for your ongoing commentary about the Gibbs and Moore film Planet of the Humans. Such a relief to hear rational thoughts on that. Yours and others like Sophia McLennan. And uh, he's telling me I shouldn't retire later this year. Sorry. <laughs> I only plan to discontinue the daily podcast, and then I'm not sure at what point I might resume occasional podcasts. Uh, I'm not ruling that out, but uh, I do want to uh, lighten my load and open my mind to other things than news and politics exclusively. So Nancy Pelosi gave the green light today, formally initiated a remote work period for the House, of course, heading into the Memorial Day break. And for the next 45 days, she has approved proxy voting, which will allow lawmakers who aren't in Washington to vote via colleagues who are voting in person in the, uh, the House chambers. Trump's still concerned about mail-in voting. And after he learned that Michigan is mailing absentee ballot request forms, not the ballots themselves, to every voter in the state. He has threatened to find a way to cut some sort of federal funding. Now, the f money that was used to mail out these uh, ballot requests came from federal money in the CARES Act and in the uh, Help America Vote Act. He's also got his sights on Nevada, where the Republican Secretary of State has made moves to close nearly all of the state's in-person polling places for the June 9th primary, and mail ballots to all registered voters. And that's being opposed by lawyers allied with Democrats, <laughs> who generally support mail-in voting. And, of course, Trump is skitzed about it, too, because in this recent California special election that was apparently easily won by the Republican, he said it was rigged because a Republican mayor asked for an additional polling place where, as of the day before the election, 39 people had cast ballots. <laughs> so it's, uh, I think we're going to have that fight around for a while. And fundamentally, the Republicans fear that if everybody has a ballot, they won't be able to suppress the Democratic vote. Trump is also blaming Democrats because he can't hold his mob rallies. And that's because of restrictions imposed by governors, both uh, Democratic and Republican. But he singles out the Democrats because it plays to his Twitter base. 
and it also is a desperate call to feed his narcissistic supply. Here's a look at today's COVID-19 update, research by Linda Lewis. She flagged for me the iPhone spyware story that we gave you at the top of the podcast. She also has the latest numbers, 324,000 worldwide deaths attributed to COVID-19 and 92,000 here in the United States. And she gave me a series of uh, stories about the results of tests, the number of positives. Texas, Virginia, and Vermont have been accused of mishandling coronavirus testing data in ways that inflate the perceived testing capacity but make the results functionally meaningless for making decisions. The states all combine totals for two types of tests, those for active infections and for past infections, uh, infections measured by antibodies. And the AP reported other states have been slammed for handling their data or manipulating it in Florida and in Georgia. And in many ways, as I've uh, talked about in the past, it's frustrating because as testing increases, the number of identified cases goes up, but it doesn't necessarily lead to more hospitalizations or deaths, and those to me are the critical factors. In Texas, Governor Abbott, despite the highest single-day rise in cases, is moving forward to reopen bars along with uh, youth clubs, child care centers, gyms, personal care centers. I guess that includes those uh, massage parlors and uh, tattoo parlors. But Saturday was the highest single-day rise in cases uh, since the outbreak began. We're also seeing restrictions lifted here in California And some of it is being done on a county-by-county basis. For example, in Napa County, that has only reported three deaths total. Restaurants are reopening. We're here in neighboring Marin County. Our restaurants are still for takeout only. In Maryland, they're setting a new high mark four days after the state began reopening its economy. Again, in the number of cases and new cases reported. But when we look at hospitalizations in Maryland, the number fell by 26. There are about 1,400 people uh, who are in the hospital, and 537 of those are in intensive care. One of the hot hot spots uh, of an outbreak is in the tribal lands of the Navajo Nation, mostly in New Mexico. And they have a phenomenally high rate, 2,300 cases for every 100,000 population. And then we shift frustratingly to data based on percentages. And this comes from a new report from the APM Research Lab that shows the uh, outrageous, disproportionate death rate among African Americans. So across the country... The rate is 50.3 per 100,000 people. Oh, that's not a percentage. So compare that. Oh, oh, I see, but we're comparing deaths to cases. That's, that's my frustration. So more than 20,000 African Americans, about one in 2,000 of the entire black population in the United States, has died from the disease. And Kansas uh, is the state where blacks are dying at uh, seven times the rate of whites. Also, nursing homes continue to be the hot spot of infections and deaths. That's an area that was neglected by many governors, including New York and California. And now to add insult to those levels of injury, some nursing homes are demanding that their residents turn over their $1,200 checks to the nursing home. They falsely tell them that the Facilities can keep the payment if the patient is on Medicaid. And if somebody tries to tell that to you or a relative, tell them that is false. Linda also uh, shared a report that in the European Union, they are looking at ways to alternate lockdowns and openness if there is a return, as many people, many of the experts uh, expect, in the fall. So what they're saying is that 50 days of lockdown followed by 30 days of uh, easing of the measures 
could be a usable strategy. Also, CDC officials who finally got to publish their guidelines for reopening, well, this may not be the same people at the CDC, but it's attributed to people at that agency. And they've said lives and money were lost because of the delayed coronavirus response by the White House. The CDC is defending itself, saying it had proposed a global advisory against air travel about a week before the uh, alert was published in mid-March. The delay caused the U.S. to lose vital time to fight the pandemic as 66,000 European travelers entered American airports every day uh, during that crucial week. And there is a highly critical op-ed published at The Guardian today under the bylines of Light of Gold and Nathan Robinson. Headlined, Andrew Cuomo is no hero. He's to blame for New York's coronavirus catastrophe. And they note how popular he is because he is uh, good-looking and coherent on TV as compared to Trump. And they say it's bizarre because Cuomo should be one of the most loathed officials in America. ProPublica recently released a report outlining catastrophic missteps by Cuomo and the New York City mayor, Bill de Blasio, which probably resulted in many thousands of needless coronavirus cases. They acknowledge federal failures played a role, of course, but this tragedy was absolutely due in part to decisions by the governor. Cuomo initially reacted to de Blasio's idea for closing down New York with derision, saying it was dangerous, served only to scare people. A spokesperson for Cuomo refused to say if the governor had ever read the state's pandemic plan. Later, Cuomo would blame the press, including the New York Times, for failing to say, be careful, there's a virus in China that may be in the United States, even though the Times wrote nearly 500 stories on the virus before the state actually took action. But they say delay was not the only screw-up. Elderly prisoners have died because New York failed to act on their medical parole requests. And... That is a serious problem here in California as well. And I want to commend The Guardian in Britain. I frequently criticize it for its uh, international coverage, for its uh, uh, support of Russiagate and the Scripple uh, poisoning case in Salisbury, England. But they have great reporters in the United States. And let's credit Sam Levin in Los Angeles because the Guardian from, uh, you know, 2,800 miles away is upstaging all of the media in California. And just to underscore my comment, every day I start in the morning by looking at a website that indexes all of the major newspaper stories in California each day. And there has been precious little reporting about the conditions in California state prisons. They have noted that about 3,500 inmates have been released. But that leaves uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 107,000 who are cramped in these tight quarters. And so far, 16 California inmates have died. 3,200 have tested positive, And we know that not all inmates have been tested. In one facility, prisoners assigned to make masks for others allegedly contracted COVID-19 in the process. Some with the virus have been unable to talk to loved ones, and that's always a problem. And uh, so they have some interesting stories here. Large outbreaks in federal prisons, including Lompoc, just north of Santa Barbara, where 1,000-plus prisoners have tested positive, and Terminal Island in South Los Angeles, where 686 have tested positive and eight have died so far. Also, at the women's facilities, CIW, the main state facility for women, guards refused to wear masks when the virus first arrived. Women would get threatened with write-ups if they covered their own faces. A 41-year-old inmate, Corrine Dela Cruz, held a prison job assisting with transportation of other inmates, and without access to mask, gloves, or protection, she was afraid of bringing COVID-19 back to her unit. So she found some bleach, and with another uh, prisoner, they were wiping down areas in their unit. When staff found out, officers tore up her cell, searching for bottles. 
The officers accused her of theft of state property, and they classified the violation as a possible felony. Yeah, it's a felony to try to protect yourself when the institution is actually putting you at greater risk. Over at The Intercept today, Mara uh, Vistendahl, I haven't seen her byline before, she wrote a pretty good article showing how Trump's politicization by blaming China and the World Health Organization without much evidence and contradicting his own statements about China, at least, that uh, were very flattering until the end of January, it is an effort to rewrite history, and they detail it pretty well. And she also says that uh, while many experts say that it uh, came from animals and was transmitted to humans, maybe at the live market in Wuhan, she does allow, quote, but other experts say that the possibility of a lab accident and infection during field work or other safety breach cannot yet be ruled out and that determining whether such a breach occurred is imperative. And she says all this is being compromised by Trump's efforts to make this a political game. And I take her points up to that level, but she fails to note that it could have escaped from a U.S. laboratory. You know, like that breach that we have little detail on at Fort Detrick, Maryland last summer. Here in California, I do credit Governor Newsom for inviting all kinds of attacks from right-wingers by giving small amounts of money to undocumented people and families. The total pool is $125 million. Uh, $50 million of that came from foundations in the state, $75 million from taxpayer money. He's already been sued over it. And this week they opened up phone lines and uh, websites for people to apply. And in Los Angeles, one agency received more than 1. million phone calls on day one of the program, 630,000 calls within the first 90 minutes. It crashed the websites and the hotline. And so it's clear that there's much greater need than there is funding. And I hope that they will find a way to add to that money because these are the people who are hurting the worst. And, yes, there are food banks and there are other efforts to support these families at a very difficult time. But they don't get any $600 a week uh, upgrade to unemployment like I do. And it is grossly unjust. I want to tell you about my friend Adrian. Last year he went to Colombia to marry the girl of his dreams. And she's still there in Colombia. He's filed all the paperwork, paid the fees. It was expected that she was going to arrive here in the United States with a green card because he's a U.S. citizen during the month of May. And I saw Adrian today, and he doesn't have any idea when his bride will be permitted to enter. And then I told him about this story, and it's the one from BuzzFeed that I told you about earlier. And they report that the... U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, which handles asylum requests, and that's what's going to cause problems here. But it also handles the legal immigration processes of green cards, naturalizations, and they're out of money because they rely on fees from people like Adrian, who wants to bring his wife legally into the country. And they've sounded the alarm that they need $1.2 billion for the near future. But one officer of the agency, unnamed, told BuzzFeed, agency leadership blaming this on the pandemic instead of horrible mismanagement and misguided policy priorities is insulting. The goal of the administration since the start has been to reduce all immigration, not just illegal. This is just furthering that goal along, reducing legal immigration. If we can't process green cards and naturalize people even for a short period of time, the effects will be felt for years. We have a couple of major corporate crimes playing out as natural disasters. In Midland, Michigan, two breached dams 
that reportedly were owned either by private individuals or by corporations have spilled huge uh, waves of water down the Titabawassee River. And Midland is north of Detroit, about halfway up the Lower Peninsula. It's on Lake Huron, or close to it. And it is the site of a major Dow chemical plant that is also the site of a major Superfund cleanup project that is not complete. And this wall of water, which could be as high as nine feet in the city of Midland, is now threatening the century-old plant that was in the process of being cleaned up. This could be a huge catastrophe that lingers with deep damage for a long time. And when the water protectors gathered at Standing Rock in North Dakota, they made the claim that the Keystone XL pipeline coming through there could breach and poisoned their water supply, the Missouri River. Well, this is about two and a half hours away from Standing Rock in North Dakota, the Bell Forche pipeline in Billings County has started to spew. And the electronic indicators that were supposed to alert the pipeline company that they had a leak failed. And this was discovered by local people who reported it this week. So far, they estimate 130,000 gallons of oil have spilled into the Little Missouri River, and another about 50,000 gallons have leaked onto a hillside. And the protesters there, including the Native Americans who organized it, were seen as alarmist. Oh, trust technology. Trust a pipeline. It's better than putting it on rail cars, right? <laughs> right. One more uh, corporate criminal is the Johnson & Johnson Company. They have been selling baby powder based on talcum that has been found to contain elements of asbestos. And now, without admitting responsibility or guilt, they said, you know, demand for the talc-based baby powder has been declining, so we're just going to stop shipping it. But it appears they'll continue to ship it to other parts of the world. Thank you, J&J. &J. And finally today, you know the landmark decision that established a woman's right to choose an abortion, Roe versus Wade? The plaintiff in the case revealed her identity later, Norma McCorvey. She died three years ago, and now a documentary film is being released uh, this Friday, in which, in a deathbed confession, Norma McCorvey admits that she took almost half a million dollars from right-wing religious figures who were running Operation Rescue, evangelicals like Flip Benham and Rob Schenck. She received gifts and in exchange, she said, well, I am a pretty good actress. So she went on camera and made statements that she had changed her mind, that she regretted having an abortion. And she made statements in opposition to abortion rights and in support of efforts to end those rights. And in that confession... McCorvey said, if a young woman wants to have an abortion, that's no skin off my ass. That's why they call it a choice. Thanks for listening to my daily news and comment podcast. You're free to share it all over the place. You'll find it on YouTube. And I'm Peter B. Collins. Happy trails to you until we meet again. Betrayed.